This video is sponsored by Ground News. Out of the latest installment of the Hunger Games franchise, Ballad of Snakes and Songbirds, my central thought was, people aren't going to learn anything from this again. And also that's a really long title for a movie. The Hunger Games stands as one of the most successful dystopian young adult series of the modern era. Both its books and films have a strong reputation that has lasted in popularity over the years. And now that we accept that no one totally owns the let's slaughter kids for the government concept, it isn't constantly being compared to Battle Royale derogatorily. And I accept and acknowledge my contribution to that rhetoric. Despite the very on-the-nose politics and allegory present in the series, we have seen repeat situations of those who love these books and part of this fandom totally missing the mark. From the racism around Rue, the backlash about the very idea that Jesse Williams could play Finnick. I think that Jesse Williams just won't work. Finnick O'Dair, in my eyes, is tall, young, disheveled, medium, long, luscious, golden, blonde hair, ocean blue colored eyes. He has a glowing tan, washboard abs, and wears almost no clothes. At the same time, he carries a trident. That is the guy I want to see as Finnick. For example, perfect guy is Ian Somerhalder. Color him blonde and throw in some contacts and voila, you have Finnick O'Dare. I'm sorry, but unless I read the wrong book, isn't Finnick Caucasian? By tan skin Collins meant his skin was darkened from the sun, swimming slash fishing. Not that he is of darker skin ethnicity. Don't get me wrong, this guy is great, just completely wrong for this role. Give me just half a second. <laughs> what the fuck? And with the prequel series, the inability to see through the absolute bullshit of white man tears from TikTok's new blonde thirst trap, Coriolanus Snow, which is such a mouthful of a name. Like, if Susan, if Susan Collins is going to do one thing for sure, two things for certain, she's going to make you think of, of the Roman Empire. <laughs> she's always thinking about the Roman Empire, which... I do too, but specifically Byzantium. Because even though the art and story of The Hunger Games is political, it doesn't mean that that's being reflected on consciously by the people absorbing it. When it comes to the world building of The Hunger Games, we know a bit of the backstory from the text itself. But The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes takes place during the 10th Hunger Games, only 10 years after the rebellion that was created to punish the districts for rebelling against Pan Am. The games themselves are at a point where they could die out from lack of interest, but because people in control and adjacent to control have an interest in continuing them, the system finds a way to make it work. But not everyone agrees with it. Coriolanus didn't show those people anything they didn't already know, that the tributes are human beings. The villain protagonist, Coriolanus Snow, is living the life of the fake rich. He is coasting on his family's name and hoping to beat the system by being the best. He puts on airs, participates in classism, is very pretentious and posh in order to make it work with his friends. Things change when rather than just winning the top financial prize by merit, he and the other students in his class are forced to mentor this year's tributes in order to get the prize. The esteemed citizens of the capital have grown bored of the games and simply aren't watching anymore. He gets 12th district tribute Lucy Gray Baird and he's into her, but he's a shill for the government so they ultimately can't be together. Still, that won't stop him from screwing over every other brown person while crying about it very dramatically. Oh. Stop crying. It won't do any good. And anyway, you have a lot of work to do, starting right now. I think the lens we get with this film allows us to see the cracks in the main series. We're always just waiting for a Katniss Everdeen to blow it up. And it's a top bottom crack. We have co-creator of the games, Dean Highbottom, who feels tormented by his creation and gets drunk to cope with it. While still being part of a system that sends kids to their deaths and empowers the richest to continue their elitism and promoting those ideologies. I hoped the games might die out. I tried to stop them however I could, but then you came along. You also have the character of Sir Janus, who was originally from District 2, but managed to make it out before the rebellion and is now super wealthy in the capital. The prize that Corio wants is named after Sir Janus's father, the Plymouth Prize, or 
something like that. I apologize. I'm sorry, H. Bomber guy, that I didn't go over this. And so Janus actively calls out the issue while also for the majority of the film being framed as someone who is politically progressive, but very much coasts on the wealth of his parents. At the very start of the film, he points out that the children who are part of the Hunger Games were too young to be involved with the rebellions or were not yet born. Shouldn't we be asking ourselves whether or not they're right in the first place? You have a problem with my games? Some of those kids were two years old when the war ended. The oldest of them were only eight. Hmm. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what we've been talking about when it comes to the events happening in occupied Palestine? The book that this movie is based on originally was published in 2020 and the current situation that is happening in Gaza happened after this movie was made. But the political situation the film is talking about isn't new. None of this is new, especially when it comes to sci-fi, fantasy, and speculative fiction, especially the most popular kinds. A clip has been going around of George Lucas and James Cameron talking about how the rebels in Star Wars are in many ways terrorists because of their battle techniques, the guerrilla warfare they engage in, and how they combat a much more powerful empire than them. In the case of the empire itself when it comes to Star Wars that we learn from the prequels, a democratically-ish elected empire. You did something very interesting with Star Wars if you think about it. The good guys are the rebels, they're using asymmetric warfare against a highly organized empire. I think we call those guys terrorists today. We call them Mujahideen, we call them Al-Qaeda. When I did it, they were Viet Cong. Exactly. So yeah. were you thinking of that at the time? Yes. So it was a very anti-authoritarian, very kind of 60s, against the man kind of thing, yeah. nested or, deep inside a, or, a, a fantasy. Or a colonial, you know, we're fighting the largest empire in the world. Right. We love art about a ragtag group of rebels taking action against a mighty empire, a force that seems more powerful than anything that you can conceive. But we never want to think that that empire is our own because then we can't detach. Then we can't just enjoy the escapism of the product. We now have to think about it. And you know what Gaston said? The other issue that I find with works like this is that we don't often go beyond we defeated the big evil because real Really, that's what people want to see. No one actually cares about reconstruction, even though you can have a massive upheaval and political rebellion. And yet, if you do not nail reconstruction, uh, you're kind of back to square one. Lately, I've been thinking about Avatar The Last Airbender The Promise, a comic book continuation of the animated series that discusses the conflict between Aang and Zuko around the Fire Nation colonies in the Earth Kingdom. I've talked about this before, uh, but I will ring this bell again because every time I think about it as the years go by, it is more and more frustrating. It stuck with me so much that I decided to actually return to the product and purchase it and reread it to ensure I remembered it correctly. And when I reread it, it was worse than I remembered. The premise of the comic storyline is that Aang promises Zuko at Zuko's behest that if he ever becomes a tyrant, that Aang will kill him. Me personally, I say disband the entire Fire Nation royal family since they are all war criminals anyway, but Uncle Iroh has to have his tea. Like everyone else, of course, I love Uncle Iroh, but he is a war criminal. <laughs> like he is, he's, you know, to the people of Bossing Say, he's their Henry Kissinger. So let's, let's not forget that the jovial uncle can still be a fascist. Then a year after the war, a conflict arises in the colony of Yudao, where a group of Fire Nation citizens who were born in the Earth Kingdom through colonial settlements want to remain in the Earth Kingdom. The main girl who kind of exemplifies this issue is named Cory, and she is an earthbender and a Fire Nation citizen. And her whole argument throughout the entire comic is, why do I have to choose? Can we be for real here, Cory? Can we be? Can we be for real here? She's biracial. At no point does Cory or any of the other people that are sort of with her in this political idea of wanting to be Fire Nation citizens who stay in the Earth Kingdom, reflect on the fact that her colony was created to displace Earth Kingdom citizens with whom her nation was at war with up until last year. When the comet last came, my grandfather, Fire Lord Sozin, used it to wipe out the air nomads. Now, 
I will use its power to end the Earth Kingdom. Even with a revolutionary theme in a series, they can fail to understand the radical change that needs to happen after. And even if you wanted to make the argument that it would be unfair to remove the Fire Nation citizens because they're ingrained, you then need to ask the question of, well, what about the people they displaced? Isn't that also unfair? And which is the more rooted unfairness? And why should the people who are now made uncomfortable because of their own government's political actions be the priority versus the people that they displaced first? And you see in this the same kind of lack of political understanding that would make Korra so mediocre as a series, asking the wrong questions and having fundamentally centrist solutions to complex issues that need a lot more rumorating than just having a hero come and save the day. You cannot fix an issue of genocide by just saying, oh, he won't do it again. If he does, I'll just kill him. Um, well, if, well, first of all, Aang, you don't even want to kill the Fire Lord, Ozai, so why I think you go kill Zuko? That's weird. You know, like, I thought the turtle duck stopped you from having to do make that decision, so I'm in confusion about even that solution. Going back to Cory, the thing that bothers me is that her nation was about to genocide the Earth Kingdom a year ago, and she never says anything about that. Where were the strongly ordered emails? Where were the, oh no, Fire Lord Ozai, please don't do this. My wife is an Earth Kingdom citizen. I don't want you to do a genocide on her home nation. Where, where was that, guys? Nowhere? Okay. But, but we can say that, oh, Ozai would never let his people get kicked around. Ozai was willing to kill your wife. Shut up, sir. What are you talking about? <laughs> And I feel like this story is trying to address the issues of sort of like ethnic nationalism in other ethno states or dual citizenship where you are not allowed to have that because certain countries you have to choose one. And I think it would be interesting to discuss in art. The issue here is not that. It is explicitly settler colonialism and the story doesn't understand that. To quote an article from Learning for Justice, the goal of settler colonialism is the removal and erasure of indigenous peoples to take the land for use by settlers in perpetuity. According to Laura Horwitz and Sean Bork's Settler Colonialism Primer, this means that settler colonialism is not just a vicious thing of the past, such as the gold rush, but exists as long as settlers are living on appropriated land and thus exists today. I had someone engage in an argument, a slight argument with me on, on Twitter slash about me calling what was happening in this comic settler colonialism because they saw settler colonialism as inherently bad and this situation was more morally gray because there were points on both sides because yeah she lived her her whole life why should she have to leave but also yeah it sucks for the earth kingdom citizens that they have to essentially lose territory because some earth kingdom colonizers also want to be here and i think this is part of why people get defensive over this kind of language they want it to be easy to separate themselves from the crime itself who wants to think of themselves as actively participating in displacement or having benefited from that generationally it is uncomfortable but that morally gray filter in my opinion is part of the process of settler colonialism because it distracts from the original sin the taking of land to displace and harm those who live there and by trying to force this idea of grayness because why should the people who are descended from the original settlers now have to deal with that they didn't do it now they didn't mean to i guess and when you do all of that you move the attention away from those directly being oppressed to those who are being made generationally uncomfortable by the reality of why they live where they live you notice that whenever people start talking about this conversation, they'll bring up native and indigenous land in the Americas and they'll all go, well, does that mean we all have to leave our homes and give the land back? How is that morally fair? And to me, it's always funny because it's like, ah, so you do agree that displacement is immoral and unfair. You do understand that the forced displacement that was done for your benefit 
was wrong. But now that you're here, you're like, I might as well use it until you yell about CRT because God forbid your children should recognize their grandparents yelling at black kids being bust. That's someone's grandma and grandpa. Part of that I think comes from this mentality that colonization is over, colonialism is over. We have no reason to fight or profoundly morally disagree with it when it comes up in media that we consume or even our day-to-day -day lives. We just kind of go with the flow because we as Americans have been taught to accept, yes, Manifest Destiny was horrible, terrible, but look at all this land we have now. Don't you like going to California? It is the reason why whenever there's a conversation or issue of settler colonialism, people will again mention native populations as if they did not fight bloody wars to try and keep white people out of their land. They didn't just say, you know what? peaceful solution all the time. This is the result of peaceful solutions was still being being moved and displaced from their land. And what's worse in the comic especially is the implication that intermarriage solves these problems. It's very gross. There's a movie out right now, Killers of the Flower Moon, based on the actual events of the serial murder of the Osage people by whites. And what is so distressing about the crimes there, spoilers for Kills of the Flower Moon, is that the white people who did this sat with them every day, married them, had children with them, and yet still plotted their deaths and the deaths of their family members while lying right beside them. And even when you get to something like Coriolanus Snow and Lucy Gray Bird, you are constantly reminded that Corio believes that he deserves to live in the capital, that everything good in the capital he is entitled to, and that if sacrifices have to be made, so be it. Those are sacrifices that he is willing to make because he does not actually believe that other people deserve things. He does. He may like Lucy, but he doesn't believe that the 12th district deserves rights. She's just hot and that's it. It doesn't mean anything. If proximity bred cultural connection, even within suppressive systems, then why would folks in the Southern upper class who were raised by their black servants not just wake up and think, you know, I think I respect black people now. I was suckling from a black teat for most of my life. I think black people are cool now. That's not what happens. We tell these stories, we root for rebels, we cheer when the very clearly designated bad guy loses because that is the way. We have been spreading the idea that empire is flawed for years. And again, some of our greatest literature and most entertaining mid-tier films have explored this. Yet when you pull back, and it comes to putting two and two together in real life or even in a nuanced, morally gray situation, all of a sudden, two plus two equals five. I personally blame the French Revolution. I think everyone is so culturally and historically afraid of the rate of terror that when it comes to media, we repeat these ideas that even those who lead revolutions are not meant to be trusted, that they are also dubious. And the only time it's not portrayed that way is when it's total cartoon evil versus total cartoon good. That's why Star Wars, even though, you know, you'll simp for Kylo Ren or whatever, there's still very much, there's the Empire, which is just universally altogether bad. And then there's the Rebels who are universally and altogether good. And while I get that and that's super entertaining, I think that part of the problem that happens is that because it's so black and white, people then ignore all the things that came into it because it may seem black and white to you, but George Lucas was basing these ideas off of concepts that would have been very uh, dis disturbing to some people, you know, to know that they were rooting for the Viet Cong as the rebels and the empire as the United States. I don't think that some people would like that. It's the reason why despite seeing how bad President Snow is in four movies, we can still give him a tragic-ish backstory. And in the end, the person that Katniss decides to kill with a bow and arrow is Hillary Clinton. I mean, President Coin. Because people fighting the fascist regime are just as bad as the fascists when it comes down to it. Of course, Amon in The Legend of Korra is secretly a bender while also fighting for the equalist because the worst thing you can be is a hypocrite. Don't you know that Karl Marx owned a factory? 
stupid socialist. Doesn't it make you feel silly for believing in something? For me, if you walk out of songbirds and snakes, you should feel something because it says something really poignant about the limits of affection and love when you really do believe in a supremacist mindset. The fact that Corio did care for Lucy but could never actually deal with the fact that she had a different culture is very key to his character. The fact that he was willing to betray the people that were closest to him and that he pretend that he engaged in class warfare against his own like fucking class. You're broke and you won't talk about other people. If you walk out of Songbirds and Snakes and you don't see the politics of that movie clear as day, I don't know what to tell you. Are you gonna punish me now? The Hunger Games films and the series are so powerful because of the roots in history and reality that Suzanne Collins pulled from. We are not watching pure speculation. We are watching our own historical darkness reflected at us in a fun mirror. It's slightly askew, but the fundamental truth doesn't change. Panem comes from the phrase bread and circuses games with Panem meaning bread in Latin. Suzanne Collins is many things but she is not subtle. People will usually ask, where do you stand? You know, with the rebels or the empire? Are you with the fellowship or are you going to join Sauron's army and do that shit? You know, are you part of the capital or are you one of the districts? But in my opinion, those kind of categories are lazy. When you look at conflicts worldwide, your local communities, the socioeconomic and political realities everywhere, are you really with the rebels? Or are you just passively part of the empire? Because not everyone in the empire is a stormtrooper or a high ranking officials. These kind of organizations run on the passivity towards evil. They are the people who just say, well, I can't do anything, so I guess it just better be here. Not everyone in the capital agrees with what happens in the Hunger Games. The entire thing that's so interesting about watching Catching Fire, which I'm watching for the first time, I actually didn't watch all the Hunger Game movies because I read all the books when I was studying abroad in Canton Berry um, after the first movie came out and I saw that primed out at the end and I just never wanted to see the conclusion because it upset me too much. I, I hate much. So it's my first time watching Catching Fire and it just reminded me of how, again, this kind of dehumanization and brutality cannot sustain itself. And when you create a reality television way that you view poverty, even if the people aren't always the brightest, even if there's toxicity that comes within it, people will still look at it and go, this is not okay. The, I, you know, when Peter dressed up on like, Caddis is pregnant, that she was like, oh no. The, the evangelicals of that world were like, we cannot let her go in there with a the baby. I think The Hunger Games is really good at showing that passiveness is just as violent as the act of people in the games. That before she realizes the cruelty of the capital, Efi is just as much a, a soldier in this battle on the side of the capital. And we all need to think about the ways that we are soldiers in battles that we did not sign up for, and we may not consciously be doing it, but we definitely make those choices. You know, why give up anything when you can just keep moving around as is and enjoy the fruits of not having to make a choice? The point is not to either just choose like, oh, I check this ballot rebel or this ballot empire. It is what you are willing to sacrifice, what you are willing to die for, and the fact that you actually believe in it. And I think when we talk about rebellions, revolutions in art, we do it so detached from the realities of what that looks like, that even now in the modern day, as those things are happening, as we're seeing genocide, colonialism, imperialism, the impact of so many of these issues, we just are sitting here Pikachu confused, even though most of the art that we have consumed over our entire generation has told us that we should be opposed to exactly those things. Because the best thing an oppressive force can do is teach you how to empathize with your oppressor. And if you make them a hot twink, well, TikTok will do that for you. Because when it comes down to it, 
we are living in the empire. Misinformation is a huge problem, and if recent online scandals have taught us anything, it is that everyone is susceptible to being misinformed. We are not all taught how to find valid news sources, how to check for bias, and we are all looking to be validated in our own feelings, which can make sometimes navigating news and other kinds of information really difficult. And that's what makes today's sponsor, Ground News, so important. On Ground News, each story comes with a visual break down of each story. So you can note the political bias, factuality, and which publications the reporting news sources are coming from. It also makes it easier at a glance to see what sort of language and framing is used in each article and in each different publication. For example, we can look at this recent news story about the police being sent to a middle school over an anonymous complaint about the book Gender queer. Right away, you can see the number of news sources that reported on the story, and you can also see of these sources, 63% of them were left leaning. Only one news source leans right. You can even see the factuality score and the ownership of the reporting outlets. For this story, 45% of the reporting news outlets are owned by media conglomerates. Ground News also lets you compare headlines and you can notice certain buzzwords or framing devices being used. For example, for the stories that are leaning towards the left, the majority of them, they highlight that it's a queer book, they highlight that this is a huge overstepping of use of policing, like getting a body cam police officer to go into a middle school to find one book is truly absurd. When you look at the one right-leaning article, it emphasizes the obscene illustrations aspect of the story. Therefore, you can see that on the one side, you have people worrying about the backlash towards queer people, queer artists, and queer books, versus the idea of moral outrage. We need to protect our children from obscene illustrations, whatever they decide that means. Noticing this kind of language and comparing it all together is great training for your brain to notice certain buzzwords, which is why one of my favorite features from them is their blind spot feature which shows you stories that have been underreported by either side of the political spectrum. And I found this story from that section. So if you're someone who is right-leaning, you might not have seen this story at all. Ground News is a great news app if you are looking for a way to actively sift through misinformation and make sure that you are being as informed as you can be. I'm offering 30% off their Vantage subscription, which you can get by going to ground.news slash princessweeks or clicking the link in the video description below. And support an independent news platform that is looking to make me media more transparent. Despite what Cersei Lannister would tell you, knowledge is power, so staying informed is the best thing that we can do, especially with everything that's been going on in the world. Knowing how to sift through information is essential. So if this is an interest to you, I would highly recommend checking them out. I've been using it and it's been really interesting seeing how we are definitely not sharing the same news at all.